Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. A 24-year-old has achieved financial freedom through real estate. How did he do it? And does going to college help you do this? Or is it an impediment? What are both the mindset and the techniques that he used to get there? And what do his family and friends think about this? He's going to tell us today. We're talking about what it takes for you to be divergent from the herd so that you can live a life of happiness and significance too. Today on Get Rich Education. Fortunately for you, Congress has made it possible to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP to invest in real estate or your own business, and that's even if you're still working. The thing is, you can get all this money tax-free. The EQRP is your secret weapon. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the EQRP company helps you unleash your retirement funds now. Learn more and text message QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Grand Prairie, Texas to Grand Prairie, Alberta and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. We're talking with a fairly recent college graduate today on how he achieved financial freedom at just age 24. You know, what's interesting is that those that are intentional, they get what they want out of life sooner. We're going to find out about some of the specific actions that a Gen Zer, only the second time we've had one on the show, the specific decisions that a Gen Zer made that helped him diverge from the herd. We're going to talk about if anything that he learned in his real estate class in college really applied to the real world as well. And let me say here that because I know I talked two weeks ago about how and why I think we've reached sort of peak college in America and how COVID broke it. I just want you to know that the college experience that I had, it did enrich me. Yeah, going to college and getting my bachelor's degree from IUP in Western Pennsylvania, it did bring me more value than I think it did most students. Because see, I grew up in such a remote rural place in North Central Pennsylvania that college was really my first substantial exposure to different races and cultures and religions. So I don't think that college is a complete waste. It sure was good for me, but I didn't have the typical upbringing. For some people, though, it's just not the most efficient use of four years of your time. And since I was somewhat of a late bloomer, um, and have I ever bloomed, really? Um, Don't answer that. But I didn't know what I wanted in college or after four years later with my degree. Really, I still didn't even know what I wanted after college. Well, this guest does know, and he is intentional. Let's meet him. This week's feature guest is a real estate investor out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he specializes in value-add commercial deals. He's the author of the best-selling book, Skip the Flip, Secrets the 1% Know About Real Estate Investing. When he was in college, he realized the traditional route was not for him, and he bought his first investment property at just 21 years old. That's not that long ago because today he is 24. When taking the real estate investments course, he soon found out that he owned more investment property than the professor, and he realized a disconnect then between what is taught in school and what actually occurs in the real world. So he set out to spread his knowledge of how the real estate industry works and how anyone can make and multiply money while also eliminating their tax bill in real estate. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Hayden Crabtree. Keith, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hayden, at age 24, you consider yourself to be financially free. That is just remarkable. And we're going to talk later about what that really means. At one point, I think you would consider that you were part of the herd, the herd as far as when it comes to getting a formal education and learning about how money works in the traditional way. But at some point, you clearly diverged from the herd. Most people never do it, and you did it earlier than most people that do it. So tell us about being part of the herd and then where the divergence really began. 
That's a long story, but I'll do my best to summarize it. I went to the University of Georgia, very traditional route. Didn't really know what I wanted to do whenever I first got into college. Me either. (laughs) I don't think anybody does. And I think that's a big problem in and of itself. But through the course of college, I ended up in an internship that taught you how to run your own business. And it was a very exciting internship. I've always wanted to own my own business. I never really knew how to do it. I didn't come from that kind of background where my family owned their own business or anything like that. I do this internship. It turns out to be an exterior house painting business, which was not exactly how I was looking to spend uh, the first summer of my college experience, but that's how it turned out to be. And in that process, I was trying to paint a client's house. And I asked the guy, I was trying to set an appointment with him. And most people, whenever you're trying to paint their house, they say, you know, can you show up after I get home from work, maybe six o'clock, something like that. So you always try and find time in your schedule to meet them whenever they're available. But this guy, whenever I tried to paint his house, I said, when could we meet at your house to take a look and I could give you a quote on painting it? He said, I can meet whenever. And to me, it kind of struck me, huh, wow, this guy can just kind of meet whenever. I'm like, okay, you know, well, how about we meet at two o'clock out of the property? So that sounds great. We get there and I get there before he does. And he pulls up in a very nice truck and we start talking about the house. I say, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, well, I'm a rental property investor. And right there, it kind of struck in my head, huh, rental property investor. It's like, they're not offering that as a career path at college. And they didn't even talk about that in high school. So I wonder what that's all about. Right. Well, fast forward a little bit more, a couple months, I picked up a little purple book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that just completely changed the path <laughs> of my life as it does for many people. After I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, immediately I thought to myself, I've got to learn more about this property investing thing. And that led me to just get on Google and type in, how do I invest in real estate? But I ended up typing in the name of my college town, which is Athens, Georgia. And I started reading through their forums. And I saw this one guy, he was talking about how he had wholesaled eight duplexes, bought them back, refinanced them out, 1031 exchanged. And at that time, I just go, what in the world is this foreign language? I don't even understand (laughs) what this guy is saying. But from what he was talking about, he had made a whole bunch of money in not a whole lot of time. And it just sounded way better than going and working at a desk for somebody else in a career that I really didn't even want to do. So I picked up the phone and I called this guy and I said, hey, I saw your post and I would really love to learn more about this. Can I buy you a cup of coffee sometime? He said, I don't drink coffee, but you can meet me at this property in 15 minutes. I said, I'm getting in my car. So I went and met this guy at his investment property. We were talking about how everything works. And I realized there was so much that I needed to learn that I didn't know. At that point, I just said, hey, I'll work for you for free if I can just learn what you know. So that led me on a journey in college. I was working for free for a full-time real estate investor. And that really led to a point where I'd start skipping class to go trying to become a real estate investor. Skipping class to go get the real education, huh? <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of how I, I first got separated from the pack. And that was back in the beginning years of college. And, you know, super exciting. That's a great way to get an education, really. When you met that property owner at their place that was a real estate investor, he told you previously he could meet pretty much any time. That helped you see the end. A lot of the best people begin with the end in mind. You know, what's the vision for what I would want to have for the future? You began to realize that this real estate investor had substantial control of their time. That probably looked attractive. That helped you connect the dots. Later, you'd go on to read about another real estate investor using all the right industry lingo, talking about his duplexes, talking about doing cash out refis and 1031 exchanges or whatever. And you began to realize some things that maybe, did you not learn about concepts like that, like a tax deferred exchange or cap rates when you were back in college taking that real estate investments course from the professor? Is that different material that you were learning in the real world already? That's a great question. Whenever I first read that, I was in my beginning years of college, so I hadn't gotten into the real estate investment course. And they do touch on it in college. I mean, I'll give them credit. They touch on cap rates and the three different ways to value properties. And and I don't believe they taught 1031 exchange or tax-free cash out refis or anything like that. But the way it's taught in college really is in such a classroom setting And it's almost taught of like how you could apply this for other people. It really isn't taught in a way of, hey, here's how you can use this information to build massive wealth in your own life, which I think is a big difference. Seeing someone apply it in their own personal life versus learning from it in a textbook in chapter 43 on page 167. It's presented as this is a path for some, but it's not necessarily what you are going to do. Sure. It definitely is not talked about in a way of like, guys, this is how you can change your life massively in very short amount of time money-wise. 
So it sounds like as you have diverged from the herd, you're sort of in this mentorship relationship, it sounds like. Tell us about that. So yeah, that's how I got started. Again, whenever I went to work, my mentor for free for over a year, great experience, you know? And I mean, it's, it's very difficult to humble yourself to say, hey, I can go out and get a job and make X dollars an hour and do all this. But instead, hanging out with my friends, instead of getting a job, I'm going to look to the future and figure out. Really at that point, I don't want to say it was a gamble, but I, I had no assurity that that was the best thing to do with my time. But I said, I'm going to work for this guy for free because I have a goal. Again, what you're saying, begin with the end in mind. Whenever my college ends, I don't want to go get a job and work for somebody else. I want to work for myself and I want to have a lot of confidence that that's going to work. So I took that on and said, I'll do whatever it takes. And when I'm talking about whatever it takes, I knew that in order for that mentorship relationship to work, I couldn't just hand the guy my time because at that point you can almost become a liability. I knew that I had to provide massive amounts of value to him. Like I would do whatever it took to provide value to him. And when I first began, I didn't even know what value to him and his business looked like. I knew nothing about real estate investing, but as you learn, you try and self-educate, bounce it off of people who are doing it in the real world, and then go apply it. Don't wait for them to ask you to do something. You just begin doing things and adding value to their business. And at the end of that year, we didn't set out a time frame of a year, but about a year after I started working for free, he just looks at me one day and he goes, you're so valuable. I can't do anything but make you a partner in this business. Wow. So I went from somebody who was working for free to now I'm working for equity in deals, bringing deals to the table managing them, raising capital, things of that nature. That takes a rare degree of foresight for you when you're in your early 20s. And most people are just so happy to trade their time for dollars that they think a better situation than trading their time for dollars is trading their time for more dollars. That's the best thing they could possibly do. That's what they think. This is key to your divergence. The fact that you were willing to work for a mentor for free and that you realize that you need to bring the value and not just the time. Otherwise, like you said, yeah, you are a liability because if you want to have a mentor relationship, you're actually a burden on that mentor. If that mentor has to go find things for you to do and try to think and come up with things to do for you, I know how that feels because I've had people that want to come around me and me to mentor them. And they always start with saying, hey, I just want to hang out and pick your brain. But you had this great foresight to think long term, not in the short run about trading your time for dollars today. How did you do that? Like, what made you think that way? That is a great question. I really don't have a straight answer. I think that one of the things I saw at Robert Kiyosaki at that time, Robert Kiyosaki was pretty much on a pedestal in my life because I enjoyed and Rich Dad Poor Dad changed my life so much. At one point, I heard a saying from him that when you're young, you should work to learn and not work to earn. And that just kind of clicked with me. I said, I need to be learning, not earning, because if I can learn how to earn, I'll never want for money again in my life because I'll be able to make it. You took that to heart. You know what, Hayden? I think a lot of people read something like you should work to learn, not work to earn. And they think, oh, that's cute. I guess he said it because that rhymes. And they go on to the next concept. No, you actually listened and applied it. For sure. And it changed my life. That's why I'm here today. That's why we're talking is that one decision in my life is really a keystone decision to dive deep and trade my time for knowledge is why we're here and why I feel like I had the ability to write the book to teach other people. And that's really the same thing that happened to me is people were coming to me saying, Hayden, I see what you're doing. This is awesome. This is awesome. How can I get involved in this? What do I do here? I want to get involved. I want to quit my job. And to me, it was just a snowball effect. And I love to help other people. But at some point, I couldn't continue to give my time to people for free and helping them. I love people. But I said, you know what, I've got to write a book that teaches essentially everything I know and learned on this journey so that I can hand it to people. And then if they want to learn and take that knowledge and run with it, they have an easy, accessible format through this book. That's right. That's a great way to think about it. Again, the name of your book is Skip the Flip. And what's interesting, Hayden, I recently met a buddy to go work out at the gym together. Um, Actually, it's kind of funny. His name is Arnold. You think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, but Mm -hmm. he's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a a Filipino guy that lives in my town. And he asked me about what I was doing lately. And I don't really get into depth with things too much if they don't understand investing. So I just simply said, oh, well, I've been doing a lot of things with investing lately. And what Arnold said to me was, oh, yeah, I plan to get into stocks and learn more about stocks soon. 
I didn't say anything about stocks. So I think the public often just assumes stocks when they hear investing. And then further than that, had I gone on to say, well, no, it's real estate investing. I think that the average mind typically jumps right to flipping. They're thinking about flipping. So we want to talk about your niche in just a moment, but clearly your niche is not flipping because your book is called Skip the Flip. So tell us more about skipping the flip, and then we'll talk about the niche that you found. You're exactly right. Whenever people come to me and they're talking about, hey, I've got X dollars saved up. I got a couple thousand. I've got twenty, fifty thousand dollars saved up. And I'm thinking about getting into real estate investing. And I go, man, that is awesome. I am so excited for you to get into real estate investing. Let's talk about this and this. And I go, well, I'm thinking I'm actually going to flip a house first. You know, I just get this pit in my stomach because I'm like, this person is so far off base. They don't even know because flipping really is not investing in any way, shape, right. or form. The biggest benefits that come from real estate to true investors, none of which you get in a house flip. A house flip can be a great way to make money and I tell people that, but there are risks. You need to know what the risks are in it. And it's also should be treated as an act of business because it's not long-term investing. So for that reason, I wrote the title of my book, Skip the Flip, to talk about why flipping is not truly investing and what true investing really is and what that means for your life and your wealth in a number of different formats over time. Skip the flip. It's such a good title. And I think you might know, Hayden, that what we do a lot of here at Get Rich Education is actually buy someone else's property that they already flipped. And we do that in an investor advantage market. And what we get to do is we get to leverage that flipper's economies of scale and leverage their bulk materials pricing and leverage their relationships with subcontractors rather than trying to line up all of that yourself. That's something that's called churn key. But yeah, I think you help engage an investor and help them learn about what investing really is, which often has more to do with passivity rather than activity. Yeah, I love turnkey rentals. I mean, I think that they're a beautiful creation that again, you know, a flipper can provide you a product, but as the person buying the turnkey rental, you're going to make way more money over your lifetime than that flipper ever will with a lot less risk too. Now, when you diverged from the herd and you found out that you wanted to be in real estate investing, did you go wide and try to learn about wholesaling and try to learn about short-term rentals and try to learn about commercial investing? Or did you funnel down into your niche more quickly rather than going broad? That's a great question. It really started out as I talked about my mentor. I just got pulled and jumped right into his business. And at that point in time, his business, they were doing wholesales, house flips, single family rentals, all the way up to multifamily commercial rentals as well. And he followed the traditional route of trying to flip houses, uh, cherry pick rentals, and then 1031 those rentals into bigger commercial properties when he could. So really the beautiful thing about my experience is that I've seen and been a part of every single aspect in that business. I've seen wholesales, I've seen flips, I've seen single family rentals, and I've seen commercial rentals. And just having a firsthand experience and not only seeing that, but doing all of them, it was obvious to me, I need to focus strictly on commercial investing because that's where the big bucks are made. That's where people are making the most progress the quickest. So to me, you know, it's a great question because I, I got to see it all. I'm not just somebody who's saying, hey, do commercial investing and do residential investing because I say so. It's like I've been there and I've done everything else and I can tell you from personal experience what's best. Now, when a lot of people think about commercial real estate investing, even again, when we've niched down that far, there are misconceptions about that. People think about office, people think about retail, but I know that's not your niche. So tell us what your niche is and why you chose it. So I am a self-storage investor and I love self-storage. Again, it kind of chose me. I didn't necessarily choose it. Whenever we first got started in our hometown of Athens, whenever we were seeking out properties to flip at this time, we just had a guy call one day and he said, hey, I don't want to sell my house to you guys, but I have these storage units that me and my dad built 10 years ago and neither of us are paying attention to them. Would you guys like to buy them? And at that time, we'd maybe listened to a couple of podcasts, but never really dove deep into the storage unit industry. But the numbers made really good sense. So we said, yeah, you know, we'll buy this and we'll dive into it. Well, fast forward a couple months after buying that one, we said, holy cow, we love the self-storage industry. And we went all in and just shifted all of our focus away from everything else, away from wholesales, house flips, single family rentals. We said, all we're going to do now is self-storage investing. And there's a lot of lessons even in that. There's niches within self-storage. So it's a great industry that we love for a number of different reasons. It's scalable. It's, as a lot of people know, no termites, tenants, or toilets. 
you do have tenants, but it's a little different laws, which is unique in and of itself. So I love the self-storage industry. I think it's a great industry for anyone to be in. Hey, we've been talking so much about clearing up people's prior misconceptions with things. I think one misconception that people have with self-storage is like self-storage, that's the industry to get out of because people need fewer things in their life. For example, technology is replacing a lot of what we need. With the iPhone, the iPhone now takes the place of your clock and your radio and your file folder and your to-do list and your mailbox and your newspaper and your video camera. We don't need all this stuff, but yet there's still good demand for self-storage. So tell us about that. Self-storage demand is market by market a little bit different, but overall it continues to rise in the U.S. I mean, there is true people downsizing and needing less and less stuff. But as a majority of what we've seen in our business, Americans are still hoarders. Americans still (laughs) love their stuff, even when they don't need it. And I think we did the math. We bought an older facility and someone had been renting there since I think 1982. And it did the math of what they had paid over time. And the amount of rent they had paid over time was probably worth about 20 times more than the actual goods they had in that unit. So People are emotionally attached to their stuff. And I think that's why the self-storage industry not only still exists, but thrives because of emotional attachment to things that don't logically make any sense. But from our perspective, it is market by market. You want to make sure that the supply and demand metrics are there, but I don't see the self-storage demand going away anytime soon. We're talking with 24-year-old Hayden Crabtree. He's the new author of the book, Skip the Flip, but he's achieved financial freedom at just age 24. So what does that really mean to him? And what's the mindset behind doing it? We're going to talk more about that. You're listening to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. We'll be right back. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans and they finance single family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Property investors can get killed with maintenance costs. That's less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in bustling Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build to rent model where you can invest in new construction, turnkey rental property. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, start now at newconstructionturnkey.com. This is Entrepreneur on Fire's John Lee Dumas. Don't follow money. Make money follow you with Get Rich Education. You're back inside Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. We're only talking with our second generation Z guest, the generation after the millennials here in Get Rich Education history. His name's Hayden Crabtree. You can learn more about him at HaydenCrabtree.com. Hayden, interestingly, in your path to being divergent from the herd, you valued relationships and networking. In fact, you met my friend, Damian Lupo, on the latest Real Estate Guys Investor Summit to see, and Damian introduced you and I, and now here you are on this show because I got a recommendation for you through Damian. So you're building networks yourself. You're doing this organically. I know that on your path to financial freedom, you also didn't show up at the party with $5 million either. So tell us more about how you actually achieve financial freedom. It's such an incredibly young age? It starts with education, really. And the education leads you to having the confidence. And whenever you can build confidence in yourself, then you really open up the world to a lot more options and opportunities. And that's really what happened for me is whenever I had more confidence in myself and and knowing what I was doing as an investor, it led me to being confident in doing things like raising capital or creating creative deal structures that were no money down deal structures that would help me control a property and be able to reap the benefits of cash flow without having to put any money down. And even those things are all driven through relationships. So you're exactly right. In my focus and my path, it's been extremely, extremely focused on building quality relationships that not only you can take and benefit your own life, but you can give value as well. So Relationships have been super crucial in my journey and my path to financial freedom. 
Now, to a lot of people, financial freedom, that is defined as such that they have enough residual income, meaning income that they don't have to be actively involved in, in order for that income to show up, such that they can meet all of their living expenses. Is that what financial freedom means to you, or is it a little different? It's somewhat different for most people. My definition is being able to have the cash flow from my properties support my lifestyle and whatever that means. So as long as the cash flow, free cash flow every month that my property spit off pays for everything, I consider that financial freedom and that's what it means to me. So yeah, I mean, I think that we're pretty much in the same line of financial freedom being, I don't have to go get a job and I can do whatever I want. However, I choose to continue to work in the properties and and try and buy more and more properties as an, an active job, acquiring more assets. So while I don't kick it on the beach all day and drink pina coladas, I am still working, but you know, don't necessarily have to be. And this has come chiefly through self-storage. So how do you do that so quickly? Some people might think, well, wouldn't I need to flip properties and work hard so that way I can get a capital gain that I can leverage into down payments into properties that pay me? Or maybe they're thinking, I just need to have the addition of time and have leverage work for me over time. But you found a shorter path through that. Tell us how. Yeah. And both of those ways are a great long-term plays that everyone should, those are get rich for sure, not get rich quick right. scheme. Great but way to say it. For me and my personal path, that's kind of what I thought as well. After working for a while, I said, man, I'm going to have to build up a war chest of cash here in order to buy enough properties to make me financially free. But just through consistent education of listening to podcasts, talking to people, networking, you know, you learn these structures such as no money down lease options or owner finance, things of that nature. And you also learn about capital raising where people who have capital and need to invest it, they don't necessarily have deals. Well, if you can figure out the other piece of that puzzle for them and provide deals and a great place to drop their capital, then that's again, a win-win situation, which is what you always want to look for. So for me, it's come through a variety of different methods, but it's always been about making sure both parties win, whether it's you and an investor or you and someone selling a property. And then the final step is just, you got to get out there and you got to talk to a lot of people. The biggest reason people aren't finding good deals like I'm talking about is because they're afraid to go out and make 100 offers and the first 99 people say no. But whenever that 100th person says yes, it'll be well worth it. So it sounds like to me, you're starting with being more scrappy and less passive. If I can read between the lines, you've done some syndications, that is pooling of other people's money to go ahead and put into your self-storage syndication. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that sounds right. Now, when we put a 20% down payment on a property, we're often using other people's money three ways at the same time. The government's for the tax incentives, the bank's for the leverage on that 80% loan, and then the tenants for the income stream. But what you're doing is taking most or all of that 20% even and leveraging your network to get people to invest in you because they believe in you and the deal that you've identified. Yeah, that's correct. And I mean, if we can draw outside capital, that's great. But another person, and a lot of people don't realize that it has capital that could invest in your project is the current property owner. You're essentially convincing them, hey, invest in me, invest in this project. And at that point, you've got to be able to sell the deal, whether you're selling it to the property owner on a creative structure or an investor. Yeah, that's a great way to think of it. Well, there's one interesting dynamic here. We talked about people. We all live in a society and you surely have friends, including friends that you had through high school and college. And Hayden, when you're so, I'll use the word again, divergent from the herd, you must have a lot of family and friends looking at you like, what are you doing? I mean, can they even relate to you? Would you even feel like you can celebrate when you've achieved financial freedom because so many people around you in your old peer group don't understand such that it's something that in your new network might only get. So what do your friends and family think about what you're doing because you're so different? There's two sets of English language that's spoken, you, in, from my perspective especially, is the non-investors and the investors, because it's an entirely different set of words and vocabulary, such as financial freedom and all this different stuff. Whenever you begin to become an investor and, and really dive deep into that journey, you find yourself more and more using those terms. And whenever you are passionate about something, you want to talk about it, and your old friends don't understand the goal of financial freedom. Or when you're talking about deals and people aren't interested, you really start to kind of drift apart. And it's not a bad thing. I think that as we all grow on our journeys, that some people are made for certain part of your journeys and they're not made for other parts of your journey. So 
I don't want to say I had it hard because it definitely wasn't hard, but being in college, so few people are on the same path that I was on at that time that you really begin to lose a lot of people that you were once really close with. And that's because you've changed as a person and it's not a bad thing to change. It's a great thing to change and become a higher level of yourself. So you begin to have less and less friends until you almost have no friends. I mean, I can tell you I've had a tons of friends and the people that have endured with me through that from the prior me, the prior Hayden to who I used to be is only a couple people. It's not a ton of people. But once you make that journey and you start to meet other people like yourself, Keith, or like we talked about, Damien, then you begin more and more to build that network and group of friends up of people who are on the same path as you that you can talk to. And now, you know, you're not talking about the ball game. You're talking about the deals you're doing. It's an interesting journey. And I've been lucky to have support from my family the entire way. It wasn't a, a path that they chose, but they support me in whatever I want to do, which has been amazing. But a lot of people's family won't do that. A lot of people's family would call them crazy for working for somebody for free for over a year. <laughs> right. And crazy for saying, hey, you've got two college degrees and you're not going to take all these job offers you have. So it's something you got to balance, but you really have to be confident in what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because I was confident in knowing that I'm doing this to better my financial future. And that's all that mattered to me. I didn't care what other people thought. Few think like you and I, Hayden, many of our listeners are the only ones in their family that think like they do and think like you do. So this really is going to help them separate that out. And you know what I find, Hayden? <laughs> if your friends are somewhat critical of what you're doing or how you're spending your time and they don't understand things, you know what quiets people? I don't like to say what shuts people up, but what quiets people? And I'm not saying that it should be this way. But it's when those people learn that you're making real money doing what you're doing. For example, if they learn that you're making, say, $300 a month off your self-storage business, they'd be like, oh, well, that's a, a nice hobby. And I don't know why he devotes so much time to this nice hobby. But if they learn that you're making, say, 30 k a month free mm -hmm. and clear from that, that tends to quiet people. They wouldn't be critical anymore. They'd ask how <laughs> right. they too, right? Exactly. And they say that the only people that criticize you are people that are doing less than what you're doing. That's absolutely the truth. A lot of people will doubt you until you do it. And then they'll tell you they always knew you could do it. And they're so proud of you. That's right. We talked about being financially free. One thing I'm known for saying is that financially free beats debt free. And most people don't even understand that difference. Financially free, meaning that you have so much residual income that all of your expenses are met and you don't have to work. You might want to work, but you don't have to work. That's financial freedom. Debt freedom simply means you don't owe anyone anything, but you might grind, work hard, make sacrifices, work on weekends, and eat dirt just to try to get debt free a couple decades from now. So talk to us about the role of debt and how you think of it when we balance financially free versus debt free. I talk about this in my book. Debt is just a tool and so many people have such a hard time understanding that. A lot of people have been raised and trained that debt free is the ultimate goal in life. Right. Listen, I'll I'll take as, if anybody wants to to give me some debt, I'll give you my personal cell phone number. I'll take <laughs> all the debt you'll give me. Okay? Cuz debt for me is a tool that I leverage and you leverage to buy income producing property. So the more debt I can get my hands on, the happier I am. So, you know, it's all about being educated on debt. What are the terms of the debt? When is it due? What is my interest rate? All these different things. And that comes again with education. You know, it's hard staring down the guarantee of a couple million dollar loan if you don't know what you're doing. But if you're confident in what you're doing, it's easy. You know, hand me the paperwork. I'll do it all day. If it weren't for debt, I wouldn't be anywhere. I don't think we'd be talking right now. I wouldn't have the time to. I'd probably be working for someone else. And I think when one thinks of debt, they think of them having to work for it and pay it down. But of course, with real estate, we can reliably outsource all of our debt obligations to someone else, namely a tenant. Yeah. And I mean, again, I dive into debt in my book. I, I think metaphorically, debt is a chainsaw. So if I have a chainsaw, some people think a chainsaw is good and some people think a chainsaw is bad. If I'm a lumberjack and I'm trying to cut down a forest, I love chainsaws because I don't want to use an axe all day. But if I don't know what I'm doing with a chainsaw, it looks really dangerous because I might cut myself and really injure myself. So one object, a chainsaw, can be both good and bad versus most people just want to say, oh, that's bad. They don't want to open their mind up and think about how can I make this object that can be bad? How can I make it good for me? So that's how I look at it. 
fire can put third degree burns on somebody, or you can use that tool of fire to make a tasty meal or to heat your home. So just like debt, fire, it's all about how the tool is used. So in your experience, we're talking about this context of dealing with your friends and family. You probably have seen yourself achieve a better lifestyle than a lot of your friends already. So what do you think the difference is? What really holds people back? Is it laziness or fear or being judged by others? Or is that their psychology has been so beaten down to scarcity over time through the system? What do you think holds people back? I think there are a number of things. And I think it's really person by person. I, For the most part, I don't think it's lazy. I don't think that a lot of people out there who could be extremely successful real estate investors because they're high performers in the job, they're not lazy people. Most of the people listening to this show, just by listening to this show, they're not a lazy person. Right. I mean, they're taking time out of their day to actively learn and listen to something. So they're not a lazy person. But maybe what's holding them back is, like I said earlier, the fear of failure, not willing to be told 99 times no before being told one time yes. So I think it can be a fear of failure. I think a lot of education is out there and people know what they should be doing, but maybe they want, like I had, a mentor or a guide in their life. And you know that's what we're providing right now is mentorship to them. But for the most part, I think that people aren't willing to fail, even though they can say to themselves, I'm okay failing. I think that deep down, we're all really afraid of failing, right. uh, especially when it comes to financially or when other people are watching and we want to prove other people wrong. But here's the thing is, you're going to have to fail. I failed so many times that it's, and I can, I hope I fail more and more because that means I'm making progress. So I think the biggest thing that's going to hold people back is fear of hearing the word no or trying something and not working. I agree. I think it's fear more than laziness that holds people back. It's the fear of failure. And then it's also the fear of judgment by other people, especially those people judging them when they fail. So Tell us more about what sort of platforms you use. Are there particular digital platforms that you use to find deals or network with people? And part of the reason I'm asking you this, Hayden, is we don't have Gen Zers on the show very often. And I often sure. think that one's use of communication and digital platforms is segmented by generation. So tell us about anything there. There's a lot of different stuff here. I have not used any platforms to necessarily find deals. But what I do find the biggest value in platforms, and we can dive into a couple, is again, the ability to build relationships and not only build relationships, but be able to build them at scale. I mean, I must, for anything I put out on the internet, I get three or four people, sometimes more, will message me asking questions and therefore building a relationship with me and I mean, someone messaged me today, I'm in Atlanta, they messaged me from Los Angeles. So the ability to be able to scale your conversations and your relationships with people is incredible. And so many people look at social media because they go, well, I don't want to scroll on Facebook all day or whatever. Well, you need to start looking at yourself as a social media producer and not a consumer. Because if you can produce quality content and build relationships, that's going to be one of your fastest paths to getting to where you want to be is building those relationships. I'm going to an event in two weeks full of absolute rock stars in the real estate world. And all of that came from social media. So yeah. you need to look at social media again as a tool that can be both good and bad. If you're wasting hours a day, then you've fallen victim to it. But there's a lot of amazing things you can do, whether it be on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, whatever it may be to actually leverage your knowledge and build relationships that are going to have a great impact on you and the other person. I think a lot of our listeners know about leveraging platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Talk to us about TikTok, one of the newer platforms under adoption. And anyone listening, I don't want them to laugh this off because you know what? YouTube more than 10 years ago was made fun of because that's where people posted cats doing stupid things in their home. And then YouTube became a platform for doing serious business. A similar thing happened with Facebook and a similar thing has happened with Instagram. With the maturity of these platforms, we see them go from early adopters where people are just having fun. It might even appear juvenile to some people to later in that social platforms evolution, it becomes a platform for doing serious business. So tell us about what you're doing with TikTok, Aiden. Huge business for sure can be done on these platforms. And again, people do definitely laugh it off. I mean, what kind of a name is TikTok, right? right. But each platform has its own unique algorithm that it, it has a desired goal. 
of what it wants you to do. So in order to be successful on that, you need to figure out what does it want you to do? Well, TikTok is especially good at figuring out what you enjoy. So it finds out that I, Hayden, like things including wealth, real estate, investing, things of that nature. So after you know a day or two playing around on it, it figured out what I interacted with and what I liked the most. And now all it shows me is stuff that I'm interested in. So the power of TikTok is it's not about a friend and a network existing. TikTok is all about discovering new information and new people. And what TikTok will do is it'll It'll analyze what is inside of your video and it'll go out and it'll start showing it to people who are interested in what's inside of your video. So it's a great way to, you know, you don't have to go click friend somebody, wait for them to accept your friend request and then maybe they'll see your post on your Facebook wall or you don't have to wait for someone to follow you on Instagram or search for your hashtag. The, the whole premise around TikTok is that it is actively putting your information in your post out in front of people who want to connect with you and vice versa. It's connecting you with people who are putting out stuff you're interested in. So it's a really unique platform that I think is going to be absolutely huge. Will it be around forever? I mean, I don't think any of the platforms will be, but for right now, I think TikTok is the most downloaded app of 2020 and has yep. huge power. With TikTok, rather than you having to go out and get it and find the group or find the friend and reach out to them and try to connect, TikTok's algorithm instead brings it to you. They make it easy for you. Correct. It's not about building a network and then just staying within that network. It's all about being exposed to new people and new information. Well, Hayden, this has been an awesome chat. We talked about what's really more valuable, a four-year college degree. We contrasted that with maybe a four-year real-world experience and everything else that you're doing. And you wrote a book in, you know, if the layperson would learn that a 24-year-old published a book out there, they might think, what could that 24-year-old possibly teach me? <laughs> but I think you've just shown us on the show today that anyone can have quite a bit to learn. Tell us about your book. So the book, again, Skip the Flip, I was getting so many inquiries from friends and contacts and people off of social media who were seeing what I was doing, you know, post pictures of new deals that were just bought or whatever it may be, or just talking to people about what's going on. People were just coming to me constantly saying, hey, I would, I would love to learn about what you're doing. I've got X amount of dollars saved up. I want to get involved in real estate investing. I think I'm going to start flipping a house. And I would just go, man, that is not investing. That is not a great path for you. So in that process, I was sitting down with a couple people every single week talking about how to analyze deals, knowing the difference between wholesaling and flipping and residential investing versus commercial investing. And I was having that conversation, the same conversation two or three times a week. And I just said, man, there are so many people out there wanting this knowledge, but I can't sit down with a million people a day and show them this, right? So how do I scale this conversation that I'm having, this conversation that is value packed, this conversation that is going to change this person's life. It's going to teach them about the tax benefits, about why debt is good and bad, about the different roles you can play in real estate, whether it's wholesaling, flipping, residential investing, commercial investing, how to underwrite properties, how to value properties, all of these different things. And I wrote it in a very, very easy to read format. It's 200 pages. It's 60 chapters. So about every other page is a chapter, very easy to read. And I've gotten nothing but amazing feedback, even to people who have done 10, 15 deals in real estate, they go, man, I learned something from this book. And I've had people who have never bought a single thing and they go, wow, I just learned so much. So I really wrote the book to teach the full range of benefits that real estate gives its owners and its investors who play the proper role. So again, skip the flip secrets of the 1% know about real estate investing. And it really is, in my opinion, it's the secrets that the 1% of people know that the majority of other people don't know. It's almost kind of like you know, the underground market of how to get depreciation and not pay any taxes legally because that's what the government wants you to do. Now, I know people can buy your book, Skip the Flip on Amazon, but you're also giving it away. Yes, correct. So again, I wrote this book because I want to have an impact on people. I want people to be involved in real estate investing. I didn't write it to make money. I didn't write this book to be an income source for me. I wrote it strictly to spread knowledge. So for anybody that wants the book, it's now a bestseller on Amazon, but I'm giving it away for free. Just go to Hayden Crabtree dot com forward slash free book. Again, that's H-A-Y-D-E-N-C-R-A-B-T-R-E-E dot com forward slash free book. And you can download the book absolutely free. There's audio copy as well for anybody who likes to listen instead of read. 
If you want the physical copy, go buy it off of Amazon. Hayden Crabtree, a 24-year-old investor, someone really special and someone that dares to diverge. Hayden, it's been great having you here on the show. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, great stuff from Hayden Crabtree. Really well-spoken, genuine guy. You know something else about Hayden that impresses me? It's that he truly invests in himself. One of the best investments that you can make, like attending a not-so-inexpensive real estate conference and meeting a friend of the show here, like Damian Lupo, at that conference. You see what happens? Then Damian reached out to me a while ago and told me that Hayden is the real deal. And then we got Hayden onto the show here. Let me just let you in on a little something from my vantage point here. We have 10 to 20 times as many requests from people to be on this show as we have available spots. I only do one show a week, and then sometimes I don't have any guests on the show. It's just me. Probably like 20 times as many requests as slots anymore. And this probably has something to do with the fact that I guess we are one of the longer running shows now, and we have a pretty good listenership. And it makes me feel a little bad that I can't just say yes to everyone. I'd like to say yes to everyone. Well, if two people tell me that they want to be on the show, and someone in the industry that I respect, like in this case, they tell me that this one is the real deal and makes the introduction, and then there's another one that I haven't heard of, and it would take a good bit of research and outreach to others to find out if they're the real deal. So, well, then it's just better for me to go with someone that I received a quality introduction through, like I did with Hayden. Can you at least see that from my vantage point? And Hayden is the real deal. What a rare guy to work for free and get mentored in the beginning, to work to learn and not earn. A lot of people hear that, but they don't do it. I know based on your situation, you might be further down the road in life and it's more difficult for you to do that. But with Hayden, it really shows an inner confidence in himself. Other takeaways for you from Hayden, don't fear hearing the word no. With social media, be a producer, not a consumer, and make prudent use of debt to build your portfolio. Although we didn't discuss it here, I know that within self-storage, the niche that Hayden is in, that he's found quite profitable, is the boat and RV storage niche, recreational vehicle storage. That caters to higher-end clientele. And you know, with COVID and recent trends, he might be onto something. Just a week ago, my wife and I finished up a four-day, three-night trip to a national park, and we rented an RV for the trip. We almost felt like we had to because all of the good hotels outside the national park, like the big branded ones, they still had these pandemic-induced closures. Well, we rented the last RV that the RV rental place had available. And it's pretty easy to believe that boats and RVs, again, the storage of those items are what Hayden's real estate niche is. It's easy to believe that demand for those personal types of vehicles, I guess, could be high for a while. People want to feel clean and have their own bubble for a while here. And with the rise in work from home culture that's probably going to be longer lasting than the pandemic itself is, I see more people even living on RVs. And since it is a more affluent clientele that owns their own boat or their own RV, they're less likely to move that vehicle out of storage over an increase in rent. So Hayden can tell you more about why his niche is more lucrative. Thanks to Hayden Crabtree today. If you want to know more about him and eventually connect with Hayden, start by getting his free ebook. It's called Skip the Flip, Secrets the 1% Know About Real Estate Investing. Again, you can get it at haydencrabtree.com slash free book. I'm Keith Weinhold, and I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.